Welcome to our annual Visitor's Day here at CBS Northwest. It's great to see all of our family members here and some new faces. I'm very glad that so many of you have told your relatives and your friends about this ministry and are helping us to spread the word. So we're very glad that you're here this morning. I'm excited about the prospect of more of us studying God's word together next year. And it's my privilege this morning to get to give you a little sneak preview of what we will be studying next year. So before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for this host church and for the freedom to be here to worship you and to study your word together. I pray that each visitor this morning would feel your love, Lord, that you would show us how to make them feel comfortable and cared for this morning, and that if it is your will, they would be here with us next year as part of our family to study your word and to grow closer to you. We love you and we thank you for your son Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Alrighty, so I, I want to get started with a little audience participation. Participation. I always like to do that, especially on Visitor's Day, to make sure y'all are awake. So if you are sitting across the table with a friend at lunch and she says, oh, let me tell you something about my mother-in-law, what are you expecting to hear? Raise your hand if you think it might be negative or it might be at least very funny, right? <laughs> Mother-in-laws get a bad rap, right? Um, we are going to see a totally different story next year when we study the book of Ruth. Ruth loved her mother-in-law, Naomi, and through their story, we're going to see what true loyalty and kindness really looks like. And then we're going to go into First and Second Samuel. We are going to follow Samuel from birth to adulthood. We will see him serve as a prophet and a priest, and then finally as one of the last judges of Israel. We will follow King Saul's reign. He's the very first king that Israel ever has. Um, and then one of the parts I'm most excited about is we're going to study the life of David. We will see God's preparation for him, for his kingship, his anointing, and then his rule and his reign. And David, although he is not perfect, and we will um, delve into that next year, but he does exhibit a lot of personal qualities that are so pleasing to God that God says of him, he's a man after my own heart. So here's a little teaser as to um, that part of our study next year. Journey with us into stories of God's redemption and sovereignty and kingship. Stories set amidst farming, corruption, injustice, tragedy, and war. Study three books of the Bible telling the history of the tribes of Israel moving from anarchy to monarchy. This study invites us into the lineage of Jesus Revealing God's plan for Ruth, a displaced widow, to create a royal lineage. For Samuel, a young boy called to be a prophet. For David, a shepherd boy to become king of Israel. Join us for a study of relationship and redemption. Where friendships are tested and loyalties proven. Where kingdoms are broken but strong leaders rise. Find out more at findmyclass.org. Well, y'all have found our class. Um, <laughs> Looks like it's going to be a great study. That's, our, that's what we will be, do, be doing in the fall of next year. And then in the spring, we will open up to the New Testament. And um, those of you who have been with us this year, we know how rich the letters that Paul wrote to the churches are. We've studied several of them this year. And the church at Ephesus was one of the most prominent churches that Paul started. And his letter to the Ephesians is what we will study next year. And 
the interesting thing about that letter is it was written to the Ephesians not to correct any specific problems in that church or even to counter false teaching in that church, but it was written just purely for encouragement. And so we are going to be encouraged and built up just as the Ephesians were as we walk through that book. And we've got a little taste of that for you as well. As loneliness and division persist in our world, the questions linger. Who are we? And why are we here? Where do we fit in relationships? How can we know we belong? Join us for a study of contrast, before and after, old and new, darkness to light, death to life. Six chapters of an ancient letter with good news for our lives today, inviting us to find belonging, identity, and purpose, community, and relationships, inviting us to meet a God who made us with meaning and calls us his masterpieces, who reconciles the divided, bringing freedom and peace. In him, we are chosen, loved, set free to grow, truly alive. Find out more at findmyclass.org. All right. Doesn't that sound like it's going to be a great study, ladies? We are excited. We hope that each and every one of you will be here with us next year as we celebrate God's grace and as we let it transform our lives. So this morning, right now, we're going to let our CBS family members go to their core group. And if you are visiting with us, if you'll just sit tight for a few minutes, we're going to take you all to a smaller room here in a minute. But um, let me pray for us real quick. Lord God, Open our eyes to the truth of your words during our core group time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hello and welcome. We have had a wonderful morning introducing CBS to all of our visitors. We have had a overwhelming response this morning. We're so excited that so many ladies have come to join us. And we um, thank you as our members for sharing the word and inviting your friends and your family to come and do CBS with us. And we look so forward to next year when we will all gather together and open up Ruth, First and Second Samuel, and Ephesians and we'll all grow together in the study of his word. If you weren't here last week, I made a big announcement regarding our children's department. Um, and the big news is after a lot of prayer um, and consideration, we have made the decision to open up our children's ministry to go through first grade. So beginning in the fall, we'll, t we'll be accepting first graders. So if you know any homeschool moms um, that have first graders, we would love to have them in our program. Um, anything from first all the way down to birth. So we are looking forward to that. We'll have first grade curriculum for those first graders. They won't be doing the kindergarten stuff. They're big kids now. They're first graders. Um, and so we are excited about that. Speaking of children, um, what a great day to be in our children's department. They are learning the story when Peter was in prison. Oh, I forgot to get the, the, this, no, the craft is so cute. It's this little thing and you put it in your hands and you run, and one side is the prison bars and one side is Peter. So you rub it and look, he's going in and out of prison. So it's, it's really cute. I've meant to grab it from the back, but anyway, so it's the story from the book of Acts. And King Herod throws Peter into jail. An angel comes, breaks the chains, and, and takes Peter out of the jail. And the aim is to teach the children that they can trust God to help them when they are in need, just like Peter did. So it's a fantastic lesson. We want to thank Marsha Truscott's group for serving back there. We're so grateful that they are because we have lots of extra little hands and feet back there today with our visitors. And so we needed every helper back there. So we thank them. 
Again, with children's, one more announcement. Next week is our annual children's program. We are so excited for that. They will be right here on the stage performing for us at 11 o'clock next Thursday morning. Um, they'll be singing the songs they've learned this year. They'll be reciting their memory verses. It's a challenge for me. If these two-year-olds can do scripture memory, why can't I? Come on. Come on, Leslie. Get it together. Anyway, so they're going to be here at 11. So if you have daddies that want to come or grandparents that want to come, um, we will take a break. I'll be teaching a little bit early. I'll finish right at 11. We'll have a break. The kids will come in and all our guests can come in and watch. And so 11 o'clock next week. And next week will be our children's final program day. That'll be their last day to spend with their teachers in their classroom on program day, on children's program day. And also next week for our Thursday class, it is your last day in core group discussing a lesson because we'll be done. There is a, um, a review lesson at the end, but I encourage you to do that on your own. We will not be doing that as a class together. But with that said, after next week, we have another week. Um, it's a little confusing for our Tuesday classes, disregard this. Um, but for our Thursday class, we'll have another week. So two weeks from today will be our share day. We have that slide. I think for our Tuesday classes, your last lesson day and your share day combine on the same day, the 25th. Uh, but for us here on our Thursday morning class, we will have a separate day, the 27th, that will just be our share day. And it is such a fun day where we come together and discuss what God has um, done in our lives through the study of his word. It's a beautiful day um, to get together. But with that said, since our children's program will have officially ended, we encourage you to find alternate child care for your kids so you can come to child to share day. Now, we will have limited babysitting that day, and it is, it's not their normal children's programming. It is simply babysitting, but we'll have limited babysitting that day. So this afternoon, if you bring a child with you to Bible study, you'll get an email from Becky Camp, our children's director, with a um, link to a sign-up genius to sign up um, your children, or we have, we're so hip here, we have a QR code. You can scan that QR code and that will take you directly to that link. We only have 35 spaces available. So um, they're gonna go quick. We really encourage you to find a friend, a neighbor, someone who doesn't come to Bible study that can watch your child that morning. We, we don't want to keep, have childcare be a problem um, to, that keeps you from coming, but um, go and sign up if you need childcare for that. Okay. Those are all our announcements for today. Um, so let's pray before we open God's word. Father God, I just thank you so much um, for this day, for bringing so many ladies um, to join us as we move forward in this ministry. And I thank you for where we are in the scriptures today. What a beautiful lesson. I pray that we will apply the teaching today to our lives and you will change us for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, most of us are familiar with pop-up ads on our computers, right? And we are all aware at this point that the devices in our homes are listening to us, right? So when you start talking in your living room about, oh, I wish I had some little garden gadget, all of a sudden, next time you open up your computer, you got all the pop-ups for garden gadgets, right? And it's like, how did they know that? And it's kind of scary, but, you know, that's where we are in life. But we have pop-up ads. Every time you click on something on your computer, it generates something. That they're looking at your profile, and so all of a sudden you get pop-up ads in alignment with what you have clicked on already. So it, made, it was no surprise um, to me that, um, because I search the computer a lot for clothing, yeah. You, you ladies that are in the class, you know I, I am like a shopaholic, um, but I have a problem. Um, but I look at all different um, clothing websites, and I have my favorites. I click on new ones every now and then. But it's no surprise to me that these random websites pop up that advertise for clothing. And so one day I was frustrated. I couldn't find anything I liked at my normal places that I go and look. And so all of a sudden this clothing website pops up and I, the cutest stuff y'all so I click on it and I start looking at it and it is really cute stuff and really cheap stuff 
Y'all might know like some of what I'm talking about, okay? I mean like $15 per garment cheap. And so I'm looking around that website. You know, at $15, you can wear it once and throw it away, right? So <laughs> anyway, so I, am, I clicked on it. And I'm looking around, and I am just mesmerized. I've got like six things in my basket. I didn't even get to 50 bucks. But um, I've got all this stuff in my cart. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. And then I looked around, and I saw this is kind of a sketchy website. I'm, I'm not sure that I, this is right. And then I started getting cold feet. Maybe this is a scam. Maybe they're going to try and steal my credit card information. I'm probably never going to get the garments. And so I closed my computer and shut it down, but that, that pop-up site just keeps coming back, like singing to me, click on me, click on me. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of months, I go to the rodeo with some friends, and the lady and I are talking, and she shares with me that she found this website, and it is cheap clothes and great clothes, and she tells me the name of the website, is the exact website that I had been looking at, and I, I'm dying to know, well, what were the clothes like? She goes, well, you know, they're not like great, but for $15, they were decent quality and they fit. And uh, yeah, I'm a repeat customer. And she says, I, I love them. I keep going back. That's all I needed to hear. That night, boom, <laughs> cart done. It's on my way. I was in need of a dress to go to a wedding, going to a wedding at the end of the month. And so I needed a dress to wear to a wedding. I found this dress. Um, Cute, right? I mean, that's cute to wear to a wedding. And so I was so excited. It was coming from overseas, so it took about two and a half weeks to get here. During those two and a half weeks, I was giddy. I kept going back to the website, looking at the dress. Oh, it's so cute. That's gonna, well, what shoes am I going to wear? And so I'm like all ready for it. The package arrives finally, and I open it up. And I pull out the dress, and I'm like, oh, that's. I go in my closet, and I put it on, and this is what it looks like. That is terrible, right? I mean, look at that. Look at that. This is, the, this is supposed to be here. It, it was just the most ill fit. It was so, I was so disappointed. I was just devastated. I came out of the living room, and my husband just was rolling on the floor laughing. He says, is it supposed to fit like that? Because that doesn't look right. And I was like, oh, goodness. He says, you need to take that off and throw that in the trash. My garment did not fit. I mean, it wasn't even a close call, y'all. I had to take off that ill-fitting garment and find something new to wear. So here's where we transition. I think this is the same picture that Paul is painting for us in the scriptures. The idea of taking off our old self and putting on our new self. He says you need to take off your old self, the garments of anger and wrath, and lying, and rage. And he says, why do you need to take that off? Because that doesn't fit you anymore. Because you are a child of God, because you have given your life to Christ, that is not who you are anymore. And that garment no longer fits you. You need to put on the new garments, the garments of compassion, and kindness, and humility, and love. And so the challenge as we go through the text this morning is, will you choose to put on the new clothes that fit? Clothes that reflect the Savior. Okay, so thus far in our study of the book of Colossians, we have seen that Paul has been addressing doctrine. Doctrine is just what we believe, right? That's what we've looked at these first two chapters, what we believe, the doctrine. He's explained the preeminence of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is Lord over all of creation. Last week we looked at the beautiful scriptures where he was talking about Jesus has secured our redemption through the cross, right? And as a result of that, all of that, all of that doctrine, believers are able to participate with Christ in our death, in our burial, in our re resurrection, and in eternal life, right? Now, beginning in chapter 3, Paul is going to pivot, and he's going to begin talking about how we take the doctrine and apply it to our lives, because it has to change our lives. What good is it to study God's Word and just have all the head knowledge and not apply it to our lives and, our, and allow him and the study of God's word to change us. And so Paul is going to teach that doctrine must produce duty. We've looked at this in some of Paul's writings earlier in the year. But honestly, for the Colossians, this was probably a very strange idea. 
In reading on the, the culture at the time, the pagan religion of Paul's day, they did not put a high priority on personal morality. Not at all. A pagan worshiper could go and bow down to their idol. They could offer their sacrifices and then go back to their old life and not change anything about the sin and, and how awful they were behaving. For the pagans, what a person believed and their actions had nothing to do with each other. And they, they were totally separate. And so no one would ever even think of reprimanding someone for their behavior. But then came Christ. And the Christian faith brought a whole new concept to Colossian society. The idea that doctrine must produce duty. Another way of saying it, we, I, I found this, uh, this is a little easier way to say it. What we believe must have a significant correlation to how we behave. It has to. It has to unite. It has to tie together. So Paul opens this chapter by reviewing what Christ has done for us already. And he begins building a bridge between doctrine and duty. So let's look at verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now that word if, he's not saying if you've been raised by Christ. The better translation would be since. Since you have been raised in Christ. Seek the things that are, above, that are above. Now, as a believer, you and I have been raised in Christ. That is our position in Christ. And as we learned in, in last week's study, that is not some theoretical pie in the sky, I hope I've been raised in Christ. That is something, that our position, it is a done deal if you are a believer. That was accomplished and finished on the cross, your position in Christ. If you are a believer, you have already been raised to eternal life, and your eternal life has really already begun, right? Because we will live for all of eternity now. Now, remember last week we talked about how we are identified with Jesus. When he died on the cross, we died with him, and our old sin nature died with him. And so we are now able to be, have victory over that sin through the power of the Holy Spirit that is living in us. So he died, we died with him. He was buried, our sins were buried, and he sees them no more. He was raised from the grave and threw off those old, dirty, filthy, ill-fitting grave clothes, right? Right? And the picture is that we too have been raised from the grave in Christ because of our position in him. But sadly, there are some believers who are still walking around in those old, filthy, ill-fitting grave clothes of our old self. Paul says, because of your position in Christ, because of what he's done for you, you've got to quit walking around in those grave clothes. You've got to throw them off. Because they are, all that ugly stuff is associated with your old life before you knew Christ. And he says, instead, you need to seek things that are above. Verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So hidden in Christ just means security and safety in God. Romans 6 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. So if you are in Christ, you are hidden in Christ, you are secured, and your salvation is secure forever, and you are eternally secure. So these opening verses, these first four verses, actually, that you talked about in your core group, these are really a bridge between the doctrine and the duty. And now he's going to start talking about that duty, the behavior that should be associated with the doctrine. And he's going to talk about what we should look like, how we should be dressing, but he's going to start with the negative and how we should not be dressing anymore. Okay, let's look at verse 5. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. This is some strong language, put to death, right? That, that is strong language. Um, this indicates that we may have to take severe measures when it comes to getting that sin out of our life. But the great news is you and I, we can't do it on our own. But Christ living in us can give us the power to put that old sin to death, right? Romans 8, 13 tells us, 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if the, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And when Paul says you need to put these sins to death, I think he's telling us you don't need to try and think that you can even dabble in this. Well, I've got a handle on this. I can just keep one toe over here and one toe over here. And I've got enough willpower I can do this. He's saying you don't think you can manage this sin with self-control. He says you can't manage it. You shouldn't manage it. You need to put it to death. Don't allow it to exist in your life. The sins that Paul is about to discuss, these belong to our old life. They don't represent Christ. And so we need to, as Christ followers, not allow that to be in our lives. Now let me just set this up for you. Paul is about to say, put off the old self, put on the new self. And it is literally a picture of taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes, changing clothes. And this, to me, really relates back to what we just celebrated this past weekend, Easter, and the Resurrection Sunday. And when the apostles go to the empty tomb and the grave cloths are wadded up on the floor, right? Jesus, as he goes into glory, he doesn't need those old grave clothes anymore. He leaves them behind, right? The picture is that for us, before we knew Jesus as our Savior, we walked around in those dirty, ill-fitting clothes, Those clothes represent our old life with Christ, okay? I wanted to give you a visible representation of what this looks like. So I've asked Tracy to come up here and be my Vanna White for this morning. She's going to help me. Um, Here she is. And we've got this filthy, dirty shirt. So put that garment on for us, Tracy. This represents, you can come come out here so they can see you soon. Yeah, look at this. This, That is ill-fitting, isn't it? Um, It represents our life before Christ, the things that Paul says to put to death. So let's just go through a few of these, what the scripture said. He said, put to death sexual immorality and impurity. Here we go. Put that to death. That encompasses any sexual sin outside of marriage. And there are a lot um, the, the, the list is exhaustive, but I, I, to me, I think pornography is a huge problem in our society today, including in the church. This is a problem within the church. And so we put it to death. Don't even think you can dabble in that because you don't have the willpower. Put it to death, Paul says. Now, I, I think it's interesting because there are a lot of people that do struggle with sexual sin. But there are a lot of other people who we can tend to get pious in this area, right? And we can say, well, since that's not my sin, I'm, oh, golly, I can't believe you're struggling with that. That's terrible. And we can wag a a judgmental finger at them just because their sin isn't our sin, right? So we need to be very careful in this area. And I love it that Paul doesn't leave it at this. (laughs) I mean, he goes on, verse 8 and 9, he says, do not, uh, but now, You must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. So this hits a little closer to home for some of us, right? Um, So it's all the same. It's all sin. So the truth is, we're accustomed to anger and lying and vulgarity, even among believers. And so sometimes we don't allow those things to convict us, and we don't correct when we see it in others, we let it slide. Whereas we'll whisper and we'll judge and we'll pray for that person who's caught up in sexual sin. But we give a pass to people who have these terrible fits of anger and judgment and wrath and terrible mouths that are just not representing the kingdom. So we need to make sure that... what. When we do that, the world looks at us as hypocrites, and rightfully so. And so, let's look at some of these a little bit closer. He says, anger, oh, you already got it. Oh, look, you're living in that old life. 
Yes, <laughs> anger, wrath, and malice. Now, I don't think this is that occasional angry outburst because we all are going to have those, right? This is a habitual act of anger. People that wake up in the morning angry and they go to bed at angry at night and they are angry at every moment in between. And malice is something I really wasn't quite sure what malice is. Malice is uh, when you do something great in your life, something great happens, I am not happy for you. But when something bad happens in your life, I'm like, yeah, yeah, right? That's this malice. This is maliciousness. He says, take that out, right? Okay. And the next one is slander. Oh, here we go. Slander. Slander describes speech, speech that tears, each other, tears others down. And here's what we Christian ladies are really good at masquerading slander as a prayer request, right? We say, oh, let's pray for Sister Mary because you know what's going on in her marriage, right? Oh, that is slander. That is gossip. And Paul says, stop it. Stop it. Obscene talk. Here we go. Obscene talk. This is coarse humor and foul language. And I... I Sure, you join me, and the, the coarsening of America is, is shocking and how fast it just is going downhill. Even in the church community, um, our language is terrible. Paul mentions lying, which is, um, you know, just comes natural for some people. Um, now, this is not an exhaustive list of things that represent our old life, but I think it's a representative uh, list of, of problems. And... Paul is saying that none of this, none of this is who you are as a Christ follower. Those old grave clothes, those filthy rags, that, that is not, that it doesn't fit you. It, it, as a Christ follower, Tracy, that doesn't fit you. That's not who I've created to, you to be anymore. It doesn't look like Jesus, and it doesn't look like Tracy. So Paul says, throw off those old rags, throw them off, because you have been united with Christ he has updated our style, ladies, which is a great thing. He says, take off those clothes. He has set us free from that. This week I read that God wants us to wear grace clothes, not grave clothes. And I thought that was a, a great little quote. And the good news is, neither Paul nor Christ leave us here in our nakedness. They don't say, take the old and, and you fend for yourself. They say, Paul says, God will give you new clothes to put on, new garments to wear, which will reflect the changes that he has made in your life so that everyone will say, look, that fits you because that's who you are in Christ. So let's look at some of these great things that God wants to dress us in. Verses 12 through 13. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, um, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. So let's quickly run through these. First, he says a compassionate heart. Oh, you can just go in any order you want. Okay, compassionate heart. As believers, we need to display compassion to one another. And I, for me, I know this is easy for me to turn off and turn on, depending on my mood. But I think what he's calling us here is to, to a constant and consistent attitude of compassion in our lives. Next is kindness. The reason we're supposed to be kind is, is because God, in his grace and favor, was kind to us on the cross and forgave us our sins. Kindness is the opposite of harshness and severity. It's the opposite of being rude and overbearing. We need to be kind. This is who Christ was. This is who we need to be. And humility, he says, put on humility. Now, back in Paul's day, just like our day today, humility was not um, something that was uh, everybody strived to be humble, right? Um, in our day today, I think pride and arrogance is what everyone wants, right? Our leaders, our even church leaders. And so our example needs to not be our secular leaders. Our example needs to be Christ. And if ever there was a person that was humble, it was Jesus Christ. Yet he was the king of the world, but he was the most humble person that ever walked the earth. Here's the thing about humility. Humility is not just thinking poorly of yourself and, oh, well, I'm not good enough. That's not humility. Humility is having an appropriate value of yourself within the will of God. Okay? And then meekness. Meekness is a word that we often um, 
misinterpret. It does not mean weakness. Meekness is, um, think, it, it's power under control. Think of a soothing wind or a healing medicine or a cult that has been broken. They all have power, but it's under control. It's controlled power. That's meekness. Patience. He says, put on patience. Or another word for this would be long-suffering. The literal translation of that is long temper. Have a long temper. We all know people with short fuses, and they react, and they snap, and they say things they didn't mean, and then they got to go back and fix it, right? He says, we need to pray that we will put on patience and put on the idea of forbearing or bearing with one another. And this is another way of saying forbearance. And forbearance, literally, it means to hold off or to hold back. And God, we are so thankful that God is forbearing towards sinners as he holds back his judgment, right? But the idea, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, they all kind of go together in one big pot. And it's just really, another way to say this is, we got to get along with each other in the church. <laughs> we need to show grace to each other, okay? Now, we might not always agree with the other person, but we need to show grace. And then he finishes this up with forgiveness. No, that's not the last one, but forgiveness, the logical result of what Paul's been talking about, forgiveness. It's not enough for a Christian um, to endure and put up with other people. We need to be forgiving of others, even when they don't ask for forgiveness. We need to forgive because Christ has forgiven us, and forgiveness opens our heart to the fullness and the love of God. And finally, he says, the love is the belt that holds this all together. It's a picture of the girdle. In the, in the old uh, ancient times, the belt was the girdle that kind of pulled their robes, cinched their robes in. It, it's this whole thing. It, it just holds everything together. And this is love. It's the most important of all other virtues. And love is the most important. And it is the identifying mark of a genuine Christian. They will know we are Christians by our love. That's how the song goes, right? It's as if Paul stands back in the scriptures and he looks and he says, this is how you should be dressing, Tracy. This is what I look like. This is what Christ looks like. This is who you look like because you are in Christ. Now, this is a proper fitting garment. Thank you, Tracy. Let me just wrap this up here. Verses 9 through 10, Paul says, you, you have put off the old self with its practices. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator. Now, this is very important that we understand. The Greek terms there for put off and put on, they indicate a once and for all um, action. When we trust God, we put off our old self and we put on our new self. That is a once and for all idea. The old is gone, the new has begun. But the verb there translated renewed, is, it says the new self is being renewed. Well, for you English teachers, y'all will appreciate this. Uh, I read this. I don't know this is for sure. But uh, it's the present participle. I don't know if, is that a present participle? Is renewing? It means it's constantly renewing. Okay, our new life is, he's constantly renewing it. So here's the deal. Some people think that once they give their life to Christ, snap the fingers, I am new and clean, and I'm never going to go back to those old filthy rags. It doesn't happen that way. There are so many times where we're tempted to go in the closet and pick up those old filthy rags and put them back on, right? But what what this is saying is make no doubt about it. That you are a work in progress. We are all a work in progress. And con- God is constantly renewing us and refining us into his image. This is this big church word called sanctification, which just means that God is doing work in the believer's life to grow us into the woman that he has created us to be. Paul says, why on earth would you choose to wear those filthy, ill-fitting clothes? They aren't you, and they certainly aren't representative of Christ. Why would you wear that when God has already given you these perfectly tailored for you gifts? He's given you new clothes, brand new, perfectly fitted garments, which reflect him. So will you choose to put on 
new clothes that fit, clothes that reflect the Savior. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for these scriptures that you've given us. Let us embrace the idea that you've called us to take off those old clothes because you have new clothes provided for us. Let us put to death those things that we struggle with that aren't pleasing to you and let us embrace the qualities and the virtues that you have called us to that represent and reflect your son, Jesus Christ, because it is in his name we pray. Amen.